Hello, welcome to this new series that I've prepared for you. This is the sociology of football and this is part one. Now the idea of this is we're going to be looking at how football can explain and can illustrate many of the sociological concepts that you'll need to know for your exam and how it can link to many other aspects of our life just like the topics that you learn in sociology. You don't need to be a football fan necessarily to understand this. Actually I'll be really keen to hear from those of you that aren't football fans and maybe tell me if it helps you understand a little bit more about sociology, maybe a little bit more about football. We'll see how we go on. You'll notice there is a reading list to go with this series. I've used lots of articles and resources by some amazing football journalists and I'll share those with you so you can develop your own further reading and see what they've done. Likewise, um, I've scoured the internet for the best resources possible. So hopefully that will help you understand and link your own knowledge to what we're going to be talking about here. So if you're a football fan like me, you may have been a football fan for as long as you can remember. On the right there is a selection of pictures. There's a very young me uh, in two of my earliest Ipswich kits. One picture with my granddad and there's my son who uh, is wearing Ipswich stuff as well all supplied by my dad and his granddad. Football is part of your identity and who you support is a massive part of that identity. And often that can come from external influences. And this is just like socialization. And uh, as with any other aspect of your identity, it can be inherited, it can be passed on, it can be a result of time and place, gender, it can be a result of class too. And how you grow up alongside football or how you grow up within football as it were can affect how you see it and how you view it and also how other people view you so being a football fan if you're lucky enough to be an Ipswich fan like me you'll know about stereotyping and stigma and labeling and misery but how you come into contact with football can vary massively maybe like me you were taken along at a very young age Maybe you first see it on the television through the mass media. Maybe it's through friends, through somebody else. And you may choose to support someone different. You may change your identity throughout life. You may not. And this can affect on how we experience the actual game itself. How we view football and how we understand it and how it links to our own identity and our own sense of self. And these are all very common ideas in sociology. And your perspective of that and of yourself and of other people who are football supporters might chime in with different ideas from different sociologists. So you may see supporting a team as a kind of consensus idea similar to functionalists. You may see it as a conflict idea similar to Marxists, us and them. Um, you may see it as inherited, you know, like your class as Marxists would do, etc, etc. So already being a football fan is fraught with ideas that linked to the perspectives in sociology. And you can see from the pictures here, you know, the, the crowd scene here is very common. It's a collective endeavor being a football fan, as is many things in sociology. So maybe reflect on why people become involved in football, why they pick an allegiance or a team and how that has a massive impact on what they do in their life. Being a football fan, being a football player, being involved in football in any way, there's a lot of room for cooperation and consensus. Something very simple as teamwork when you actually play the game. But also when you go and sit in the stands, when you go and sit at the stadium and you're all dressed in very similar colours, you chant together in unison, you look for ways to support your team and maybe berate the other team and the officials and whatever else it might be. There is a sense of cooperation and consensus even in the most maybe deviant behavior you could see outside of the context of going to a game there's a sense of history and of culture passed down you know the trophies that your team have won or not won depending on who you support the the feeling of elation when a goal goes in or when a game is won or when a title is won versus you know the abstract misery of relegation of being defeated there is this idea that fans can be what's known as the 12th man to use a footballing term 
and add an extra dimension to support and add an extra dimension to their team. And also the idea of their stratification in football. The best teams are at the top of the league and they deserve to be there because they play the best. Obviously, there are critics of that theory and they sound very Marxist in their ideas, uh, particularly when it comes to money in football and whether teams really deserve their status or not. So you can already see how you can apply these different ideas to football and the experience of football. Football and class is an incredibly controversial subject. If you look at the origins of football, going way back beyond even the modern game as it were, it was always a game played by peasants, you know, across fields, across ta whole towns involving massive groups of people. These days, footballers are seen as an elite. They are incredibly wealthy, potentially. It is assumed that pretty much all footballers earn way above, you know, regular person's wages, if you like. Now, you might look at the three footballers across the top and recognise two of them. Actually, Messi and Ronaldo are two and three when it comes to the richest footballers in the world. Faik Bolkia, whose name I've probably completely mispronounced, you may never have heard of. He's uh, a Brunei captain for the international team, tiny nation. He's worth way more than both of them because his family, uh, uh, royalty in Brunei essentially, they have billions and billions of dollars and his own personal wealth because of that outside of football is estimated to eclipse even the richest footballers. But generally speaking, there is a myth of meritocracy maybe in football but an idea that working class men or working class boys rather escape poverty through football particularly um, in the earlier periods of English football and maybe more in say modern day Africa or modern day South America where there's an idea of children escape the slums escape poverty by playing football now football is rooted in working class ideology as it were the reason that Saturday 3 p.m. is uh, such an institution in British football comes down to the working habits of Victorian England. When the Factory Act of 1850 was passed to limit working hours, there were Saturday afternoons free. And the church, the society at large, worried that working class men were just going to spend Saturdays drinking and getting into trouble. So football matches were put on at three o'clock. And that is a big part of the professional game. These days, with globalisation, with television rights, top flight football on Saturday at three o'clock is controversial, as it were. It's seen as something that everyone wants, really, but doesn't get um, for, by a lot of football fans. But outside of that, the people who run football, maybe they don't see it the same way. Maybe they want games throughout the day to, to televise. Regardless, the idea of, you know, when Saturday comes, it's the title of a film about football, it's the title of a, a long-standing magazine. It, it, there's an idea that football should be played on a Saturday afternoon, and certainly as I was growing up, that was the thing that was really cherished and became mythologised, as it were. So you could link it to Marxism and the idea of the working man leaving the factories after a Saturday morning's work, going to a game of football. And if you look at the photos from the Victorian era, you know, football crowds... Again, they're all dressing the same. No, they're not in replica kits because they didn't exist then, but they're all working class uniforms, if you were, you know, flat caps are there, your, your sort of shirt and tie, and there's a sense of identity that we talked about earlier. So what you might want to think about is why is football, even today, still thought of as a working class sport and a working class environment, and still a very male dominated one too. And how does that link to what we know about Marxism and the idea that society is is unfair and not structured necessarily in a way which benefits working class people does football buck that trend is it an argument against marxism or does it prove marxist right in, in a wider scale beyond the players marxism and football may sound like a really odd concept given that football is seen as so pervasive and global and, and mega rich but often it's depicted as the fans against the men in suits, the kind of faceless corporate element of football which runs the game versus who really is the game as it were. Is it the people in the stands, the people that pay their money, that follow their team week in, week out, 
versus perhaps this idea of there are, there are authentic and true fans who go to the games and perhaps what football fans deem plastics or people who never go watch on TV, armchair fans, as they're sometimes dubbed. There's a shared consciousness in football that football should be there for the fans, by the fans, as it were. And this leads to some clubs having fan ownership or very strong pressure groups within fan, fan communities. In Germany, you have specific rules governing how German clubs have to have cooperation and participation and ownership amongst fans, as it were, as well as more wealthy benefactors. There are clubs in certain countries which are overtly communist or have communist links or communist backgrounds, particularly in places like Italy, um, Germany too, perhaps. There is a very strong political connotation to supporting certain clubs and those clubs have come from earlier politic, political environments, should we say. So if you know your history and you know you know, what went on in the 20th century as far as say communism is concerned, you can trace a line all the way back to Marxism and Marxist ideologies. Um, likewise, there's a sense that there is a small elite which are incredibly powerful. Um, people like FIFA have been subject to arrests, convictions and accusations of corruption for many years. Uh, and football itself is often talked about as being quite corrupt in some respects in terms of administration. So this would play into a lot of Marxist narratives and Marxist ideas that you will have learned about. So there's a lot of wealth in football. There's capitalism at play, there's sponsorship. There's an image of football which has changed alongside the growth of the sport and the, the amount of money that's gone into football. So you would see Marxist criticisms of society and of wealth and elitism. You could transfer that directly onto football very, very neatly as well. So you may want to think about these mega rich clubs and how they treat people and how they use their money and how that's often seen negatively by a lot of other fans and a lot of other people within society. You may never have considered it, but football has its own language. If you think about Bernstein's ideas about restricting elaborated code, there is a sense of truly understanding the game and knowing what people are talking about and how that can link to the idea of whether you're a genuine football fan or this idea of authenticity again, or whether you're an outsider. You know, the game has as well a multinational, multilingual aspect when it comes to language. When football first started, it was very much an English export around the world. Foreign players, foreign clubs who took this English game on, they talked about an English style versus a Scottish style. They used words like goal, um, whereas they wouldn't use them remember, in the native language. But then as football's developed, it's come back. So in the last few years, certain positions have, you've got German names like Ramdeuter or Libero from South America. Trey Cortista, um, I pronounced that horribly, but the point being that they're, they're Spanish or German or Italian Portuguese words which have specific meanings in that football culture which us as English speaking fans have then taken on again. So there is a whole code and symbolism just by the words that we use. Likewise there are chants and songs and idioms which belong to the game. You'll Never Walk Alone was sung by lots of different clubs, but it's really become Liverpool's and Celtic's. Um, but glo globally, perhaps even Liverpool have, have really taken it on. Um, there's certain ways that you talk about people and that is very, very much in terms of identity and belonging. And there's football cliches, you know, playing the man, man on, offside, um, these ideas that this very, very specific language from football, which comes into everyday use, uh, you know, it's a game of two halves. It's, it's played on grass, not paper, this kind of idea. A transfer window in football always slams shut. You know, there's sort of in jokes as well within football, which can be quite complex. So if you're not socialized within football, you might not understand what people are talking about necessarily, or you might misunderstand the meaning. So you can look through football text through watching a game through listening to commentary and start to pick up that there's a specific lexicon a specific language 
and how you interpret that might be down to how you're socialising in football too. And it can inform your understanding of the game as well. The last thing I want to talk to you about in terms of being socialised in football is statistics and the study of football. Football analytics has been made possible because of technology. And as with many advances in society, you could argue that if society is in a postmodern phase, as some sociologists would say, football is too, we're absolutely flooded with statistics now. And this is something which has really, really increased in the last 20 to 30 years, I would say. Football now has a whole set of jobs that people can do where you don't have to have played the game to any particular level to have a really important role and to be well paid within football. And analytics aren't just used by the people that play football or manage football teams. They're used by journalists as well. The people that write about football are used by academics. So there's a whole new facet to the game, which is as a result of technology. And it's made the game a lot more complex and perhaps even links to what we talked about earlier about being authentic and understanding the game and reading the game. You know, when I was a kid, it was sort of, you'd watch a game of football and you try and learn and pick up ideas. Now there's way more to it than that. And it's fallen into the mainstream. So you will see on football coverage, the graphics, you will see presenters with little tablets moving arrows and icons around the pitch. And as the computers have got better and more sophisticated, so have the graphics and the use of them. And this changes how we experience the game. You think about some of the hyper-reality, like Baudrillard's idea. We don't just sit and watch the game anymore from the stand. We have different camera angles. We have slow motion replays. We have computer generated graphics. We have freeze frames. We have computer generated views, um, all adding to what we physically see and what our brains compute. And then we have the statistics to go along with that and we're expected to interpret that. So there's a language, there's a physical and almost emotional surge of input and data that as football fans, as, as watchers of football, as well as players, as well as managers, you have to interpret and understand. So this can really build on the other ideas that we have, your experience of football and how you understand and how you talk about it. That can decide you know, do you know what you're talking about? Are you going to be accepted by the football community? Um, does that really matter anyway? Is that important? For some people, it'll be really, really important for others. That they're not going to care. But statistics also allow us to measure and to track. So if you think about your research methods and quantitative data, the more data there is now, the more we can analyse the game and look at research methods and talk about patterns and trends. And you can think about, well, had this data existed 50 years ago, could we compare, you know, the players of the 60s and the 70s, even earlier than that, the Victorian era, and seen has football changed that much? We're told it's evolved massively. There's then evidence for that, but because we don't have the data, there's a dark figure, if you like, we can't map it accurately. So football has quantitative data. It has valid data. It has lots of different parts to it that go way beyond just 22 men kicking a ball around. This has been part one. I am going to continue with a lot more um, depth and sociological terms and links. Really keen to know what you think of it. Please leave me your comments. Please leave me your questions. Please come up with your own ideas before I do parts two, three and however many more. Um, I hope it's been interesting and I hope it's made you consider sociology and the game of football a little bit differently.